words. All right, we'll go ahead and start. I uh, want to just begin with saying um, thank you for agreeing with Daniel 12, 1 and 2. Um, that's huge. I'm not so sure he would really want to do that. I mean, I mean maybe he does see it the same way that I do. If so, then I don't know why we're debating. <laughs> so, But anyway, look at, the, look at Daniel 12 again. So he says that Daniel 12, 1 and 2, he agrees, is the resurrection and uh, the rest of the chapter. How do you get? How do you get anything, anything prophetic, taking place in Daniel, from chapter one to chapter twelve? How do you get that out of the Roman Empire? I don't see how that's possible. How any prophecy made in Daniel goes beyond the Roman Empire? Now look at this. Matter of fact, it doesn't go beyond the destruction of Jerusalem in seventy, because in Daniel twelve, he said the question was asked. How long will it be to the end of these wonders? So the angel asked, how long is this going to be? How long is it going to be before the resurrection that he said he agrees with happens? And the other things, too. And notice the answer. He said it will be a time, times, and half times, as soon as they finish shattering the power of the holy people. Now, if George believes that the holy people are the Christians, then here's his dilemma. He believes, I don't know, I mean, he didn't say, but if he does, he believes that the power of the holy people being Christians is the power of the gospel is going to be crushed at the end of the world. Now, how does, how, how I don't even know what to say to that, because the, it's clear here when he says that the power of the holy people will be crushed. So if the holy people are the Christians, which he didn't answer that question, he said all these events will be completed. Now, I know what the power of the holy people is, and I'll just go ahead and tell you because we're running out of time, and I don't want to wait for him to uh, run the clock out again like he did on the judgment thing, which I'll answer that in just a moment. <clears throat> but look here in Romans chapter 3. Here's the power of the holy people. Verse 1, Then what advantage has the Jew, or what is the benefit of circumcision? Great in every respect, first of all, that they were entrusted with the oracles of God. So Romans chapter 3 Verses 1 and 2 teaches that the power of the holy people was the law, the oracles of God. They were entrusted with that. What separated them from the Gentiles? They were entrusted with the law, the law of Moses, Torah, Tanakh. This is what they had. It was theirs. And they became very uh, inflated about that. You know, they were really um, just stuck up about that. So that's the power of the holy people. Now, when did that power come to an end? When was it totally crushed? If you're going to say that that's not going to happen until the end of time, then you need to go start buying you some goats and doves and different things and build you a temple and start making some sacrifices. And, and because the law is still in effect. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 and 18, he said, I did not come to abolish the law. What did he say? But to fulfill it. Listen to this. Verse 17, do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I say unto you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until all is accomplished. So he said heaven and earth is going to pass away, and so will the law. So if the law has passed away, heaven and earth has passed away. And I don't even have to go to an interlinear to prove what heaven and earth is because I'm going to go to Deuteronomy. I'm going to run right over to Deuteronomy chapter 31. And here's what we're going to see in verse 24. When it came about that Moses finished writing the words of this law in the book until they were complete. And Moses commanded the Levites who were carried the ark of the covenant of the Lord saying, Take this book of the law and place it beside the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God that it may remain there as a witness against you. And then we skip down for sake of time. Verse 28, assemble to me all the elders of your tribes and your officers that I may speak the words. Well, what words of this law that was made complete in their hearing and call the heavens and the earth to witness against them? What was a witness in verse 24 and 25 and 26? The law of Moses. What was a witness in verse 28? The law of Moses. <laughs> so heavens and earth was that witness that was destroyed according to Jesus' words, if you want to take his words for it, which I do, Matthew chapter 5. So we'll just leave it at that. So so how do you get anything out of Daniel? Now, this one I really liked too. I'm not trying to answer everything because i got a couple things I want to bring up here. But he said uh, that, that 
this uh, was like a thief in the night. And he agreed with that. The end of time, that you can't find any verse in the Bible that talks about the end of time. Robert, Hebrews chapter, uh, Ephesians chapter 3, if you would, uh, in the King James, verse 20 and 21. I want to show you what the scriptures explicitly say about this. And this is one of those verses that, that your Bible uh, teachers just skip right over. They don't like to answer this verse because it doesn't make a lot of sense. So I'm going to read it now. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly all that we ask for thee, according to the power that works in us, unto him be the glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages. Do you see that? World without end. Amen. I say to that. World without end. So he's 100% right. The Bible does not talk about the world coming to an end. As a matter of fact, it explicitly says, according to the Greeks, and in the way they state things, and this is very emphatic, the way they state this, it's expressing in the best way that they can endlessness. I don't know how else to put that. So George and I agree that the world will never come to an end. <clears throat> All right, so I asked him, George, do you believe and agree with Paul's doctrine on the resurrection? He said yes. Well, let me show you what Paul's doctrine on the resurrection is in Acts chapter 24. Acts chapter 24. I agree with Paul's doctrine on the resurrection, and apparently we have a disagreement. But here's the reason I agree with it. Verse 14 says, This I admit to you that according to the way which they call the sect, I do serve the God of our fathers, believing everything that is in accordance with the law and that is written in the prophets. So Paul is saying, I agree with all of, all of the Tanakh, everything. Hoping or having a hope in God. So what's their hope? Well, we'll see. Which these men cherish themselves. But here's their hope that there shall certainly be, or there is about to be, if you look at it, a resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked. Now that's Daniel chapter 12. And he said that his that that hope was the hope of what? Of Israel. The hope of Israel. Hmm. Well, that's interesting. Let's look here at Acts chapter 26. The resurrection was the hope of Israel. There is no eschatological hope from this point forward. The church today has no eschatology. Jesus is not going to return. That's eschatology. Es eschatological. Um, the resurrection is not going to happen. It falls in the same category. <laughs> okay. We have no eschatology for today. It was fulfilled. In the first century, by all of these statements that we see, and if the hope of Israel was resurrection, then what hope do we have? Well, we have fulfillment. I don't have time to go into all this, but we have fulfillment. Matter of fact, uh, let me skip something here real quick. Romans chapter 5 and verse 5. Do you remember what we said about that? Romans 5 verse 5. Look at this. And hope does not disappoint. But the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. The Holy Spirit was given to us as a pledge. Well, I wish I had time to go through all this. But 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and Ephesians chapter 1 teach that the Holy Spirit was given as a down payment. The Holy Spirit was given to us as a down payment for all of these things. And when these things take place, the Holy Spirit came to an end. So guess what? Let me read it again. They had hope, this resurrection hope. That resurrection took place in the first century, and then, guess what? The Holy Spirit ceased. It was fulfilled. And we see that in Zechariah chapter 13 to verify that. And I'm not going to spend much more time exegeting that, going from verse to verse, using the scriptures to interpret the scriptures. Maybe we can talk about that another time. Otherwise, he believes in the gifts of the charismata if the resurrection is to take place in the future. So if that's the case, I miss my grandma and grandpa Watson like crazy, and I would love to see them again before I uh, see them again. So maybe we get a little resurrection going on. Either way, let's move on. <clears throat> I want to show you something in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that blew me away when I saw this. So I think I got enough time to do this. Five minutes, John. No, no maybe I don't, <laughs> but I'll try. Okay, so 1 Corinthians 15, we are going to go back and look at some Greek tenses, some how these things are used. So in, in 1 Corinthians 15, here's 26 occurrences where the present indicative, uh, indicative active, it's been a long day, it's getting hard to talk. 
and uh, or middle or passive is used. And all of these things indicate something that's going on right now, like preaching the gospel and making known or standing or am. He says, you know, I am doing something or preaching or being found and all this other stuff. Okay, so there's not a person, a Christian on the world that's going to read through 1 Corinthians 15 and see all of these 26 occurrences of this and say, oh, this is supposed to be something that takes place in the future. Yet, when we look at 28 references to resurrection that have the same exact usage, and we want to say, oh, no, that's in the future. That's so far from the future, we don't know when it's going to be. That, my friends, as George personally put it, is disingenuous. That's not being honest with the text. That's not honoring the Greek language, which the Bible was written in, which Paul spoke in, which he said, when I write, you can understand what I've written to you. They would have understood the Greek tenses. Now, do you have to be a Greek scholar to know this? No, I'm not. All I did was get out, sorry, an interlinear, <laughs> and looked it up. And it took me several hours, but there it is. So there's my point about that. So what are you going to do with that, Georgia? How do you how do you say that? And, and even the greatest Greek scholars on this planet cannot explain why resurrection is in progress in First Corinthians chapter 15. Well, I can tell you why, because Paul said it was that Jesus was the first fruits. We already went through, went through this, and the second first fruits offering was on its way at the end of the harvest. That is how resurrection was taking place in the first century. It was in progress. That seems pretty simple to me. And I'm just a simple guy. But I want to talk about 2 Timothy chapter 2 real quick. Because when I read 2 Timothy chapter 2, I get this feeling that comes up my spine. And I start thinking, oh man, I must have had this all wrong. And then I wake up from that nightmare and realize I was wrong about my nightmare. <laughs> 2 Timothy 2 doesn't prove a single thing. You can call it uh, whatever you want, uh, place any names on it, but in 2 Timothy 2, Hymenaeus and Fletus, here's, brother, here's what they did. They said that uh, Hymenaeus and Fletus in verse 17 were men who were gone astray from the truth, saying that the resurrection has already taken place, and they upset the faith of some. Now, I'm going to prove to you from 2 Timothy chapter 2 that the timing of the resurrection was in the first century by Hymenaeus and Philetus, an error that they were teaching. They were teaching that the resurrection had already passed. So here's what these brethren did. If you truly believe that the resurrection is going to happen in the future and that you believe it like the brethren in the first century believed it, that the resurrection was a bodily, physical resurrection that would happen in the future, then the brethren in the first century didn't get the memo. You better get your DeLorean and go back in time and set them straight. Tell them what the scriptures really meant. Because Hymenaeus and Philetus and told them that the resurrection had already passed and some faithful brethren were upset because they believed that it already had. How could that be? Because they went out and looked in the grave. Well, there's grandma. She's still there. Oh, there's great grandpappy. He's still in the grave. Resurrection couldn't. Have, that is not what they did. They knew it was spiritual resurrection. Hymenaeus and Philetus said the resurrection had already passed, that they didn't see it, that they missed it. Guess what? They were smart enough to be upset about it because they were looking for it. Remember, we just went through 1 Thessalonians and uh, 2 Thessalonians and looked at that. They were looking for this resurrection to take place in their lifetime. Now, why would they do that? Because, again, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 24, verse 34, that these things will happen to this generation. Did you see that? Did you look at it? Did you mark it in your Bibles? It'll happen in this generation. George has us murdering people in heaven. Do you realize how ridiculous that was? And, and I, 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 I'm i sorry to put it that way, but I don't know how to describe something. <clears throat> it's, it's desperation is what it was. And he was running out the clock on judgment. Judgment, I need... I need to, can, George, can I borrow about 10 minutes of your time? No. <laughs> I think I should say that. Okay, so the judgment here, I want to illustrate this, that the judgment, ju uh, look at 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 6, judgment takes place in our physical bodies, in our flesh. Did you hear that? Did you see that? Can you understand that? And I want to get over here and read this, verse, 
uh, verse 6 says, For the gospel has for this purpose been preached even to those who are dead, that they through uh, though judged in the flesh as men, they may live in the spirit according to the will of God. You are judged while you are alive. When you reach the age of accountability, you die. Yeah. 